I'm not too sure about you, but if you listen to the job titles that have certainly been uh, discussed today, it certainly shows you that we're moving into a new trajectory, right? Uh, gone are the days where perhaps you just uh, uh, were comfortable with uh, areas and sectors that we used to uh, with regard to job creation and, of course, uh, job and economic opportunities. But we are certainly leading the charge and the plug when it comes to venturing into new avenues. And that does speak to new sectors and new uh, wealth, that has certainly been the theme for today. As we know, the March cover of the Forbes Woman Africa magazine has just been released, and I'm lucky enough to have a copy in my hand. I won't reveal the cover just yet, because that's a moment that we'll share with you on screen. However, our March cover is one that relates to new wealth creators. They are female entrepreneurs who are making profit from unconventional areas, ideas, and industries. They are those who have created significant impact in their chosen sectors by transforming the market or company within which they serve. Some of them have even innovated new products and services and are pioneering their organizations in generating new untapped streams of income. The nominees will achieve or will have achieved positive financial results, have adopted sustainable development goal initiatives, increased shareholder value, created jobs, and have sound management and good corporate governance. Together with these intangible qualities such as integrity, vision, and leadership, women on the African continent have been making headway as drivers for change in many, many ways. They are the new wealth themselves, essentially. Ladies and gentlemen, let's turn our eyes to the screen uh, for a moment uh, to uh, welcome back as well on stage the managing editor of Forbes Woman Africa, Mithal Renuka, who will perhaps not give us guidelines at the moment for this particular panel, but let's monitor the screens for an introduction to this panel that I'll be leading in conversation regarding new wealth creators. Me being a new wealth creator means creating economic opportunities for women on the ground in Africa. It is about finding sustainable solutions and solutions that have a true societal impact. And being able to create employment and opportunities for other people. This is very important to me as an entrepreneur because everything that I do is about the betterment of Africa. And so it's not about giving the 1% even more money than they already have. It's about spreading the wealth among a lot of different people. Because if you had to ask me what would I like to be in when I grow up, I would say a wealth creator of women. My name is Rachel Sabandi and I'm the founder of MHub and Earth Energy. Hi, I'm Arlene Mulder, the co-founder of We Think Code and Toybox. Hi, I'm Dinewa Dioma and I am the co-founder of Cape Biotechnologies and Deep Medical Therapeutics. I'm Nisha Addy, co-founder and CEO of Jetstream Africa. Sabona. I'm Sarah Collins, the founder of Wonder Bag. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jessica Anuna and I'm the founder and CEO of Clasha. I think the best part about being a woman is just being strong and being able to do what we want to do once we put our minds to it. I was raised by a really strong woman, my mother, and she really taught me that I can go after anything I want if I put my mind to it. If you look across the continent, what we're doing here, the innovation we have, Often the world does not see that. They see the problems, they see the corruption, but actually we, we're very innovative and we can be the best in the world. And I would like to show the world that. I want to be able to create something that really puts Africa on, on the map. So I think wealth creation in the 21st century is not about just numbers, it's about people and it's about distribution across a broader, a uh, group of people than have historically had access to wealth. I'm a new wealth creator. A wealth creator is somebody who's innovative without being dictatorial. They are giving the keys to the door, but they're allowing somebody to take those keys, open the door, and flourish in their own way. Start now. Start where you are, and start with what you have. We are the new wealth creators. And welcome to our Forbes Women Africa photo shoot. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage our new wealth creators and the cover stars of the March edition 2019 of Forbes Woman Africa magazine. Please warmly welcome them up on stage. Fantastic cover stars indeed. So uh, if you haven't met one just yet, we certainly have at least five of them for you to interact with and wealth creators. I do want to mention that Rachel Sibanda unfortunately couldn't join us due to her son taking ill and has since had to uh, take care of her little one and unfortunately couldn't make it here with us today. However, we continue with the five remaining cover stars and I think perhaps for us to get more insight into a brief snippet of where it is that they're creating wealth, what kind of services and sectors that they have to be in to bring us into an understanding of uh, the dynamics that they face with on a day-to-day -day basis we're going to break the ice literally 30 seconds for you each to essentially tell us what it is you do how it is that you're doing it differently and why this is a new wealth creation stream Arlene let's start with you as we make our way down the panel um, thank you so much. It's great to be here. So I'm the founder of We Think Code. We completely look differently at the way that education works. We started with democratizing education by making it free and accessible to everyone. We've completely changed also the way that it works. We have no teachers, no classes, and then we work with corporates to make sure that our students actually have a job at the end. Dineo, let's come to you. I am the co-founder of Cape Biotechnologies, which is essentially a biotechnology company. And what we do is that we manufacture reagent enzymes or rather chemicals that researchers use in the lab to manipulate DNA, so to cut, clone, um, and amplify DNA. Um, it's a really niche environment that we're working in, and we're currently the only local manufacturer of these goods, which is really quite exciting for us. Our researchers rely on imports, so we're really excited that we're the currently the only local manufacturer of these products. And we're also building a technology platform that will enable us to harness the power of artificial intelligence and TB genomic data to improve TB outcomes in South Africa. Jessica. So I'm Jess, the founder and CEO of Clasher, and we're an online fast fashion marketplace for millennials in Africa. So we ship to millennials in one to five days um, versus 21 to 30 days from Western retailers. We also allow payments in local African currencies, which is really important. We've spoken a lot about fintech today. So we offer payments in Nigerian Naira, Ghanaian Sidi, Kenyan Shilling, South African Rand, and we continue to add other African currencies, which is really important. So I think take yeah. it in quickly. <laughs> Shall we do it? And acknowledge, and acknowledge that before. <laughs> Fantastic. Sarah, let's come to you. Hi, I'm Sarah Collins, the founder of The Wonder Bag. I'm very proudly Zaliwe KwaZulu Natal, Zaliwe Zulu Mina. And I developed The Wonder Bag 11 years ago, and it's fabulous to be in Durban with all of you women. Misha, brief description of the sector that you're disrupting at the moment. Sure, I'm Misha Addy, CEO and co-founder of Jetstream Africa. We're based in Accra, Ghana. We are an export logistics platform that enables agribusinesses to push their products out into global markets at a lower cost and with more visibility than cross-border trade is right now. I think a variety of sectors that have certainly been mentioned by our panelists and some interesting themes that have come up, of course, DNA, retail, logistics, uh, basic beverage consumption, and of course, education, which are quite critical. But one thing that certainly stands out for me in having read the cover uh, and the actual articles profiling your companies and the entities is the role of technology. Everything from coding to the scientific use of it, as well as traditional systems which have been implemented in the past and yet have a new innovative and technological way of enhancing our livelihoods. I, I want us to pick up firstly, uh, Daniel. Let's start with you and perhaps an exchange with Arlene as well as Misha and really understanding how this digital drive, this techno technological age and fourth industrial revolution, we often think of it as a thing in the future, but it's right here. It's right now, and it's enabling us to venture into this, these new sectors. How has it helped you in your studies, in establishing your entity, to actually grow and advance uh, this new wealth sector that you're looking to create? So with the first business in Cape Bio, that has been quite an exciting um, avenue to be working in because 
as it stands, the biotechnology industry in South Africa and Africa as a whole is not really as developed as we'd want it to be. So um, we're really quite fortunate that we've received quite a lot of support just from the government, the CSIR as well, which was quite pivotal in um, developing the products, and they understand the need of how important it is for us as Africans to be involved in the fourth industrial revolution. When it comes to biotechnology, artificial intelligence, they're really trying to um, upskill Africans as a whole to make sure that we contribute to this fast-moving um, um, economy. And also with the likes of your artificial intelligence, as I, as I mentioned earlier, is that you know, there's often a lot of fear around, you know, computers taking over our jobs and... The robots <laughs> are coming. That's what The we robots think. are coming. However, on the upside of it is that we've seen that there's so much good that this technology can do. So, for example, if you read up on research papers based on the use of, for example, artificial intelligence and healthcare, they're able to extract much more richer data that we as humans wouldn't be able to um, fathom or um, try to comprehend in a short space of time. So that is also an aspect where you can see that these technologies are able to then complement and actually improve the um, different industries that we're working in. And it's really also quite exciting that um, there are Africans who are also actively participating in these areas and it's quite exciting that we won't get left behind in this arena. Not getting left behind. Arlene, coding was a, a completely new world that you decided to introduce your, yourself to, but do you see technology being that enabler or panacea which has led you into this new wealth creation sector? Absolutely. Um, I studied mathematics and coding myself and I, what I always saw was just knowing those technical skills and being able to use them then you can create anything that you can imagine. And it was really that power that inspired me to start We Think Code. And there's just a massive demand. And if we teach young people, if we just empower them with that little bit of knowledge so that they can, in, that they can create anything that they can imagine. But then what we also did with We Think Code is we ourselves use technology. Because now, how do you make it open to everyone? So mm -hmm. we wanted to really make sure that we democratize education. And how do you do that? Because normally, this is where the barriers lie. You have to have um, a matric, and you have to have certain grades. So we use technology, so we just let our students play games. And now, all of a sudden, it's open and accessible to anyone, and we can find the people with the true potential through leveraging technology. Yeah. Misha, this has also helped within your business regarding logistics, and sometimes when we think about technology entering a specific sector, we always think that it's meant to push out a slightly older generation and facilitate the transition of a new, but you've changed that and actually shown that that's a complete uh, a farce. Yeah, I think the great thing about working in logistics is that you work at a cross-section of different types of industries, different types of people. We're working with wealthy importers and uh, truckers who are making very basic wages, and they all have to touch the technology. And we do that in two ways. The first way is through track and trace. So if you're shipping something from the rural north of Ghana into the United States, for instance, there's no visibility currently. You can't tell where the shipment is or whether it is <laughs> anymore. And so our system allows you to visually use the online system to see where your shipment is while it's over land, while it's going through African customs. The second way is visibility into the economics of the supply chain. Currently, exports, the exporting process, eats up about two-thirds of the landed cost, the wholesale cost sure. of an import. And when you think about how hard farmers work, how hard people in factories work, they're getting the minority of the value of their exports. So by bringing visibility to the actual costs that are being consumed by the supply chain, we're helping reduce those costs. Exactly. I do want us to go back to that element that we I just wanted to raise a moment ago with regard to the age element when it comes to technology. We mentioned coding and you think, my goodness, I'm already 35 and that's way too old for me to actually think of coding. You can only imagine what a 55-year-old would think about, but yet there's new and maybe even old, innovative, technological elements and systems that we can use here. Sarah, I want us to be, that perhaps to be the segue, just to understand how you looked at something which was a traditionalist system used in many households previously, but yet has become this technological evolution. And perhaps uh, we can also tie this in into what Jessica's thoughts with regard to her experience working for one of the largest tech companies and, and that perhaps there's some kind of synergies and segues that we can find uh, regarding this theory, regarding technologi technology. Well, I think there's a huge collaboration between the technology, the fourth generation, 
and an age-old technology. So people think that, um, you know, when they, they meet me, they think I'm a, a, an inventor or, a, you know, an engineer or somebody really clever. I'm not. I'm a Zulu girl who really um, understood that Igoko and the household, the people in households and the young girls growing up were all spending time over fires. And unless we re-looked at how we cook across the continent of Africa, not only are we going to deforest the whole of Africa, but time poverty. When do young girls, when do people have time to get back into school and to actually um, to move into the, into, into the, the, you know, as leaders into the future. So the Wonder Bag, which is a culturally relevant age-old technology, is actually a technology. So not all technologies come out of Silicon Valley or from very bright people, but what we have intersected with is actually things like Amazon platforms. So we've been able to sell it globally, so to take a, a business from a South African KwaZulu-Natal innovation to a global platform and use that to connect it into a, a commercial circular economy so we can subsidize the bag into communities that need it the most. And that's where I look at the wealth creation is actually bringing money into the households. But we are using Amazon and the logistics and all of the technology that's provided globally sure. in order to bring this alive over the last 11 years. Indeed, bringing wealth into households, which is something which is so pertinent uh, in every uh, household as well as the uh, environment. Uh, Sarah, I do want to get your, your views on the level of exposure when it comes to finding these new markets and new avenues of wealth creation. Certainly it takes an element of technology which entices it and highlights it, but you're one lady who has been exposed to the globe. You grew up in London, you speak French, you speak Mandarin, uh, and of course had the opportunity to work for Alibaba, a huge technology company respected across the globe with regard to mentorship and participation in tech incubation companies. How, how critical has it been in your journey for you to actually realize that exposure to new sectors, new industries, a variety of cultures and backgrounds actually contributes to how you view wealth creation and being a wealth creator? Absolutely. So in my life so far, I've been very fortunate enough to live and work in five different countries and I've been very exposed to language and culture from a very young age. Um, as you mentioned, I spent uh, three and a half years living in China and going to university there and that exposed me to how quickly the technology industry is moving and how advanced it's becoming as well, way advanced than what's going on in the West. Um, so again, I've been lucky enough to work for the likes of Amazon and Shopify and looking in detail at how they're creating wealth within their companies, within their employees to then bring wealth on the outside and bring their products to market. Um, so, I mean, culturally for me, living and growing in these different countries definitely exposed me to how important it is to be able to have a digital global mind. If you look at what's going on now with globalization and Africa going through digitization, um, it's really clear that a lot of these outside Western factors are having an impact in Africa. But what's key is that we do it the African way. We don't just copy and paste what's being done in the West, in mm. China, and in you know, the UK and the US, and copy and paste that policy into Africa because it just doesn't work. Um, so what I'm excited about is what's going on now in Africa on the continent. I'm very excited to lead a team of um, young women. We're all female team, all under 27 years old. Um, so really being able to empower my team, um, you know, working in software engineering, working in leadership, working in operation, operations and logistics, that's what wealth creation really means to me, bringing economic opportunities to women on the ground here in Africa. Yeah. Dineo and Misha, I'd like to come to the two of you. Indeed, critical points raised there. Because the sectors that I think you're both involved in, whether it be the logistics and the long impact that it has on the agricultural space, or whether it's in uh, biotechnology and sciences, we heard the stats from the previous panel regarding female participation, never mind female participation of people of color in some of the sectors that have been listed. And that naturally does become a slightly stumbling block when it comes to finding the right mentor, seeking the right sponsorship, and pursuing your innovative interests. How? as dynamic young women of color, do you look to continue pushing the boundaries and opening up the path for new wealth creators who themselves might be struggling in these spaces? So 
Um, speaking for Cape Bio, I think for us it's really important that first of all we have um, diversity and also inclusivity in our team. So those are the key things that are also driving us in terms of our decision making even when we're looking at um, future recruitment. Um, but yes, you are right, um, especially in the biotech industry, uh, it's unfortunate that a lot of um, students who have studied biotechnology end up working either in the banking sector or as sales reps for pharmaceutical companies and don't really get into working in the research labs because the jobs are quite limited. So for us, we're taking this as an opportunity to create um, opportunities for people to come and actually do biotechnology work and not end up doing something else with whatever degree that they've studied. So this is something that's really important to us. Mm -hmm. Misha? Yeah, I mean, I think in, in one of the morning panels, we heard that it's important as a woman to not pull the ladder up as you've been boosted. And I think that um, Jetstream and me personally, we definitely have been boosted. Every single investor who signed a check for Jetstream is a woman. Um, and 60% by number of our customers are women. So I see very much the... 60. 60% of our customers number. are women. Quite significant. So I see very much of our work with SMEs as work that benefits women disproportionately. I have to say, though, that in agriculture, the people who are doing mass production, scaled production, tend to be men. And so as Jetstream grows, I would like to work with more and more women who are moving out of the SME space into the large commercial space, and it would be great to grow with them. Just on that, how else can, can, can we change that particular landscape to actually show that there is a, a rapid race, ra rapid pace, excuse me, of transformation that takes place regarding gender parity? I think that um, in, in the industries that I see, which are, are male dominated at the, at the big, at the scale level, capital is, is incredibly important. So it's bank loans with uh, fair interest rates, it's equity capital, it's early stage venture capital, and many times investors tend to invest in people that are similar to them. And so the lack of uh, women in this space just perpetuates fewer women in this space. So I think that um, to the extent that we're starting to see a few more women every year in the investment space, we're actually propagating more women businesses, more women-led wealth, and more women-led investors. So it's a virtuous cycle. Yeah. And that's a question I actually want to throw back to the rest of the panel, perhaps to share your insight, that we haven't really touched on the theme and element of mentorship. We've been saying everybody needs to have a seat at the table. Or forget that start up your own table and of course try to create these new industries but if there's no guidance if there's no stepping stone if there's no uh, compass or gps in these days to actually give you a guideline then it seems as though there's a perhaps a set of a mismatch mentorship sponsorship coaching are these all elements that have assisted each of you uh with, within your various spaces Arlene, you can go first, and anyone else, feel free to jump in. I think that's, that's extremely important. Um, sometimes I think entrepreneurs, they are the ones who are naive. They think anything is possible. So sometimes you don't follow a path. But I think it is very important. I've been lucky to, so I worked in investment banking before, and there were very few women, but one or two that were really amazing. And if I just think back to now, we think code. So we were two female co-founders, and still in our first year, we only had 6% women. Wow. Luckily, two years later, um, or three years later, we have 23%, and we aim to have 50% by 2021, 50% female coders. And the way we do it is we change the narrative. Um, we just show, actually, you know, coding is a sexy industry. It's amazing, it's creative, it's innovative, but that's how we change it, not by changing the criteria, mm -hmm. not by lowering the entrance for women. Yes. We change it by telling the story. And now our current female students, they become the mentors and they become the role models. Yeah, absolutely. I'd also like to add to that that my business partner and I were actually both fellows of the Alan Gray Orbis Foundation, which is an entrepreneurial scholarship. And mm -hmm. through that community, it really is so enriched with um, people who are mentors in different sectors. And I have to attest to that, that we've really benefited from that. And I believe that even as women in this room, we have that ability to create a similar network where we have access to finance, access to information, um, access to people in different um, industries because we know as a business you need that access to a particular market and um, that can easily be facilitated even through an introduction. So even as women we can come together really and just be able to empower one another, mentor each other and open doors for each other. Mm -hmm. Anyone else looking to add to that comment? Sure, yeah, Sarah. I think for me it's, it's an incredibly important thing this and um, mentorship and asking for help. 
And you know, 11 years ago when I started, I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. And for me, I think it's also to be vulnerable, to actually say, I'm not perfect. Yeah. But I we're don't... scared of that, aren't we? Especially as women, because you think, oh, I need to come yeah, to the table with my is... aim game. Well, I'm going to tell you something about me. Mm -hmm. It's the first time I've worn a dress in public. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you what, <laughs> I have played down who I am because I didn't want to be seen, I didn't want to be judged, and I didn't want to be trolled on, this, uh, on social media. So I thought I could be more successful playing myself down. So when, when I was um, doing the photo shoot, all these girls said to me, ladies, said to me, have you heard how you speak to yourself? They said, you are so cruel to yourself. You've been amazing to all of us. And I suddenly thought, hey, I'm going to strut my stuff. I'm going to mm -hmm. own me. Yes. I'm going to own being a woman. <laughs> and you know what? I have done great things. I have one and a half million wonder bags out there. Mm -hmm. That means one and a half million women have time. Girls are back in school. How fabulous is that? Mm -hmm. And that's the message that I want to share is we've got it in all of us. Ask for help. Yeah. Tell people when you're drowning, because it's tough out there. Hmm. I can tell you, Amazon and all of those things didn't happen overnight. Certainly not. So it is a journey, and we're all in it together mm -hmm. as women. And I think it's so exciting to have these conferences and summits where we can sh uh, share and Technology. We've got WhatsApp groups. We're yeah. hanging out together. <laughs> yeah. Already. Rachel Sabanda, who's not here, and mm -hmm. I have joined a partnership, and I've launched in Malawi with her as Wonderbag. Yeah. That's what it's about. Yeah. yeah. I Jessica. Just, and I just want to add quickly the importance of corporate mentorship as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I've been fortunate enough to be on a program of Alibaba called the eFounders Program where we work with Alibaba and United Nations Conference for Trade and Development to grow and scale our business in Africa. Um, also the Techstars program. Um, I was on an accelerator called Techstars last year, and they were able to pass on nuggets to me about how to speak to investors, you know, what to do when you're you know, in a room full of you know, financial experts, how to speak to them. So when people join my team, I pass those nuggets on to them. Everybody that joins my team, for example, um, comes with me on an investment pitch meeting. Um, they all learn French as standard. We have weekly French classes. I want my girls and my team to be domain experts in e-commerce and fashion. So that means I need to be able to teach them and empower them the way I have been. Wow. Um, yeah. Exactly. And that's quite important because you're paying it forward, which is uh, something that has been highlighted earlier on uh, in the conversations we've had today. I, I, I love the elements that are being brought up here because so often we might be sitting here looking at you on the wonderful cover of Forbes Woman Africa magazine and thinking, your life's been easy. You found the sponsorship. You had the overnight success. You're on the cover of a magazine. You've got copious amounts of funding available at your uh, uh, fingertips. No, and Sarah, so you're saying completely no. no. And I think all of you agree with that. And, and I think that's the point why we have these conversations, that we can all resonate with the experiences that we've had. Many of us here have tried to realm into the world of entrepreneurship and had failures. Some of us have been able to find success. And I actually want us to go down the panel and actually contrast some of the worst failures you've ever experienced. Even that failure that you don't want to admit in public, you're doing it today in front of this audience. <laughs> and some of the best successful highlights to, to show us that it is a journey and one that at times is actually quite tumultuous. Arlene? It's really tough. <laughs> it's tough to start a business. And I, I often say to other people, if you are not completely passionate about what you're doing, do not start a business because you're going to wake up, they draw this graph that's just say one day you think it's great, the next yeah. day you think it's terrible. Yes. And that is really the truth. Um, but if you really believe in what you do, and uh, the most important thing and the biggest lesson for me was just to be true to yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult because we often think the world puts us in different boxes, but actually we put ourselves in those boxes. But we think we must be like this and we must be like that. And then you read books and they tell you to be like this. And I tried to be all these different things. And then I just realized it doesn't feel like me. Mm -hmm. And I just need to let that go. And then the other big lesson for me was to learn how to deal with people. And people are difficult and different. Oh, we're and tricky, hey? We're moody. We're so we... tricky, <laughs> myself included. 
Um, but these are things that you never learn in school or anywhere else. And these are the lessons that I want to share now with others as well, because um, it would have helped me a lot if, if I knew how to deal with that better. Yeah. Do you know? Yes, and just to touch on a point that Arlene mentioned um, earlier that I think even in the entrepreneurial community we don't speak about a lot, is entrepreneurial depression where you're like, wow, am I sure this is the right choice? I mean, I could be in corporate knowing that I have a salary, um, I don't have to take care of people, and I think we really need to move forward as well to just supporting one another um, as a community of entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs as well, because I also believe we face different challenges compared to our male con counterparts. So just building that support system of those days when you really feel like, oh my gosh, I, I think I bit more than I could chew. Um, but yes, really just building that sense of, of community. But I think one thing that's also really important for us is that everything that we do has meaning and it has purpose. I'm like the quintessential millennial. Um, I really, everything that I touch has to make an impact and it must contribute to the bigger um, picture. So yes. um, I'm not only driven by money, I believe money can always be made, but what impact are you making in society? And that what, that's essentially what gets me up every morning. Yeah. Jessica? I think for me, in terms of biggest failure, um, I would say just not listening to my intuition. You know, when I think something isn't quite right or when I go ahead anyway, it normally doesn't work out well. Um, so I think just my message is just to listen to, you know, your inside, listen to what your intuition is telling you because more often times than not, it's right. Um, and just being collaborative as well. Jessica, oh, perfect. I think we might have lost your mic there slightly. The, slightly, the last elements you mentioned were certainly based on, on trusting your intuition a lot more. So we will make a handheld mic available to you uh, as we do try to uh, reach the concluding remarks of the, sh of the panel. Uh, Sarah, you wanted to add something. And my greatest moments of my life are when I go into villages where women have lived below 10 US cents, where they've lived in abject poverty, and going in two years later, and they literally lift me up and say, thank you for giving us back our dignity and freedom. Being in those rich communities of happiness where I've contributed to the economic stability of those rural communities, those are the greatest joys of my life. There are so many mistakes, but I think the most traumatic thing for me was when my partner and, and my management decided to do a management buyout because they'd lost faith in me and I knew that they were wrong. So I started the 1st of July on my own all over again halfway through my Whoa. 11 years. <laughs> sure. Misha, we'll come to you, and then Jessica, just to wrap up the concluding points after um, we lost your audio, unfortunately. Yeah, it was just mainly about listening to your intuition. Yes. Um, I think for me, whenever I haven't listened to my gut in business, it's, you know, yeah. most almost always not turned out well. Um, so I think just listening to what your inside gut is telling you is just really key to not making the same mistakes twice. So yeah. that's probably my biggest failure, so to speak, in business. Mm -hmm. Misha, we'll give you the opportunity to conclude. Sure. So Specific, um, specific uh, failure. Jetstream is actually my second startup. The first startup I did, I tried to do on my own, and that in and of itself was a failure. You know, there's a, the saying that you know you walk farther if you walk together. And I think I have acquired a great deal of patience and empathy for other people, and also a recognition that building a startup and entrepreneurship is not a one-woman show. It's a partnership with a lot of different people, whether they're inside your company or outside. So the first thing that I did when I started having an inkling that Jetstream was a promising business opportunity was look for those other people and build off of relationships. Collaboration, building off of those relationships, understanding that perhaps failure is part of the journey and losing other individuals across the way. Trusting your intuition, your oh. gut, whatever it is, that internal yes. voice that it is, just relying on it and depending on it, making sure, of course, that you uh, expand on uh, new opportunities uh, and uh, engage on some of the challenges that you face. And, of course, um, uh, making sure that you grow and expand across new opportunities and sectors that certainly do come across. We've had a wonderful time with our panelists, giving us some insight into new markets and new wealth that's certainly being created. They are cover stars. If I were you, I'd get an autograph. Mine is going to be signed. And of course, each of you will also receive a copy of the latest Forbes Woman Africa March edition for 2019. Please give my panelists a round of applause as they make their way off stage. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.